Okay, we are live. Hi there, and welcome to Mentionables TV. This is the fourth installment of our series on answering questions that no Christian can answer. Our team of apologists takes a look at a video by the Non Sequitur Atheist page, wherein they pose 15 questions that no Christian can answer. Enjoy the answer to today's question. Here's my question Why would an omnipotent, all powerful God need a human sacrifice in order to forgive people their sins? If this being is truly capable of doing anything, has unlimited power and resources, and is all loving, why would it require a brutal torture and killing? Why would it need a blood sacrifice and not just simply forgive people their sins? Especially if it knew their motivations and could judge people according to their intentions. This question has always baffled me, even when I was a Christian. I love this question because it really gets to the heart of what Christianity is all about. Why can't God just forgive? I mean, if somebody does something bad to me, I could forgive them. Why couldn't God do the same thing? I don't need a sacrifice. All right? So this same question is actually brought up in Scripture. In the book of Job, you have this guy, Job, who has suffered a lot of bad things happening to him in quick succession. And he's his friends are under the impression that he's being punished for something bad he did. And he disagrees. So he monologues a lot, and at some point he asks the question, what is it to God if I sin? Why can't God, essentially this question, who could do anything, simply ignore or forgive? So the question goes about this idea that, you know, forgiveness doesn't cost us anything, right? Well, imagine that our what the Bible calls sins... The, the offenses that we bring against God are like corruption. They're, they're like a disease. And we all know that diseases can't simply be wished away or ignored. Diseases have to be destroyed. If I have bacteria in my body in order to cure me, they need to destroy the bacteria. If I have a virus, my body needs to fight it and destroy the virus. Same thing with fungal infections. And th same thing with cancer. Cancer is actually cells in my body that have corrupted, and you have to destroy those corrupt cells. And this is something we intuitively understand. I'm reminded of the movie The Green Mile, which is based on a story by Stephen King. In this movie, you have this character, John Coffey, who has this magical ability to cure and heal. So he, for instance, brings his pet mouse back to life after it dies. He heals a bladder infection, and at one point he even heals a brain tumor. And in order to do that, he sucks, he literally sucks the corruption into himself, and he absorbs the damage or the corruption. Now he's a big guy, so he can kind of handle, handle the pain, but it makes sense. The corruption just doesn't get waved away or dismissed. It's actually destroyed. So uh, imagine, if you will, a blood transfusion. So here you have a person that has a blood disease. And you have another person who's perfectly healthy. They lie down side by side on the operating table, and then a catheter is attached to the two. And in that period of time, the healthy blood is transferred into the sick person, and the corrupt blood is transferred into the healthy person. So you have this transferal of health and corruption. This is exactly what is happening on the cross. You have Christ, who's lived a perfect life, taking on the corruption of humanity, and then in his death, destroying that corruption. And this is the means by which God can forgive. So forgiveness is not like imaginary money. It's not this thing that kids are playing together and one's like, I've got an ice cream cone, pay me $5. And the other one's like, okay, here's some invisible money. And the game is complete. But forgiveness isn't like that. It's not just non-existent nonsense that you can hand out to anybody just out of your imagination. Forgiveness actually costs something. And... 
the price for that forgiveness was paid by Christ. Christ destroyed the corruption so that God has the ability to forgive. Now, God is the ultimate authority figure. He's the ultimate judge. So if somebody does something against me, say they ding my car or something, I can take them to small claims court. I can't prosecute them myself. I have to take them to the state, the higher authority, who can do the prosecution. And then if the small claims court doesn't do it, I can elevate it to the next level of authority. And I can keep elevating it until I get to the Supreme Court, the ultimate authority, and their judgment is filled. But in the theistic universe, their authority comes from a higher source of authority, the authority. Authority itself is embodied in God. And so God is the one who forgives or condemns. I can't do it. And anybody who does is borrowing authority from God. So when God has destroyed that corruption, anybody has access to the living, healthy blood of Christ. And, you know, we have a ritual uh, in the church. We have this symbolic ritual of the Eucharist or communion where we take the blood of Christ. Symbolically, at least I believe so. But the idea is we're taking his purity in exchange for our corruption. Now, if you don't choose that, then you have to live with the consequences of your corruption. So, we ha God has purchased the means by which he may forgive. Within God, he has to destroy corruption. He did destroy corruption. We may accept the healthy blood and take advantage of the health offered by Christ, or we can live with our corrupt blood and be destroyed along with it. Now, again, we'll circle around back to that. why can I forgive? without any sacrifice. I can forgive because that forgiveness was purchased by the highest authority, God. So when I forgive, I defer to the judgment of God, who also has the ability to forgive. If the ultimate authority hadn't forgiven this person, I wouldn't have the ability to forgive. I could say I forgive them, but that forgiveness is just pretend money. The reason that I, as a finite human being, have the capacity to forgive is because I'm passing that on to the ultimate authority. Ultimately, any act of defiance or sin is an act against God because he is authority. He embodies authority. So if they hurt me, they've broken a law and are accountable to God for that law. So when I forgive, I'm just deferring to the higher authority, God, and he has purchased the means by which he may forgive as well. This is a truly astounding thing about Christianity that makes it unique, and it's one of the things that makes it superior. All right, here, Godless Cranium asks what appears to be a tough question, but it's actually built on a few false assumptions. I'm tempted to here simply give a presuppositional criticism where Godless Cranium can't account for the laws of logic that he's trying to employ, or the moral standard that he's clearly relying on from within his own worldview, but I could give that response to most of these questions, so I'll refrain from detailing that all out here. So what can we say about the false assumptions of his? Well, first, God doesn't need human sacrifice in order to forgive people. In fact, human sacrifice didn't save anyone. This kind of language reflects a pagan understanding of Christianity that I've exposed in my uh, episode entitled Pagan Pelagianism where I argue that atheists typically think of Christianity within the lens of their natural works-based self-righteousness, views of God as just a really big, super powerful Zeus. They're just categorically wrong on the kind of thing that Christianity is and the kind of being that God is. So God didn't need anything. God ordered creation how he desired it to be. And Jesus, by the way, wasn't a human sacrifice. I understand the confusion here because Jesus is associated with the sacrifices of the Old Testament and he was human. The problem is that they think the thematic arrow goes from Jesus back to the Old Testament sacrificial system. That's because that because animals were sacrificed that Jesus therefore had to be sacrificed like them. This is just a reversal of the type anti-type of the, the shadow and the substance, how themes are actually developed throughout the scriptures. You see, in the Old Testament, the animal sacrifices were a way of pointing forward to Jesus. 
to show that people could not save themselves and that the penalty for sin would be death. That's what the sacrifices were aimed at. And they were only a shadow. Jesus wasn't offered up as a, a sacrifice in the human sacrifice type of sense. Old Testament language is used of him because he is the fulfillment or the reality to which the sacrificial system pointed. While he was handed over by the priests, it's not as though they were offering him up to God. They hung him, but they didn't put him on the altar. His blood fell, but it wasn't collected and sprinkled on the altar and the people. Those were all Old Testament symbols that pointed us to the true reality of what Jesus was going to do in his person and work. What the cross finally showed us was not that Jesus is and God are appeased by blood, but that it took God to do what we could never do for ourselves, and that payment of death was justly required. Now, this brings me to the second point. Couldn't God just snap his fingers and forgive everyone? Well, the answer is actually no. That would not be loving or just. Imagine your mother had been raped and brutally murdered, and the judge, in the name of justice, just snapped his fingers and forgave the murderer who committed the crime. Would you praise that judge for being wise and loving or just? Of course not. But that's precisely what godless cranium is advocating for here. Building on this is my third point. If you think back to question one at the very beginning, I pointed out the failure of the internal criticism and that these kind of errors are ubiquitous in atheist objections. Do you remember that? Well, here we have another one. Notice that Cranium here is giving an argument that is in the form of assuming that God does exist, and, as the Christian claims, and that we've sinned. Couldn't God just snap his fingers and forgive us, especially if he knows how good our hearts and our intentions are? Now, notice that the first two are what the Christian claims. God exists, and we've sinned. But the second two are notions entirely foreign to biblical Christianity. Within Christianity, God is just. The wages of sin are death. We're not worthy and cannot earn forgiveness. God could punish us forever and be just. And the heart of the human is desperately wicked and depraved above all else. It's not filled with ooey-gooey, saccharinary, saccharinary sweet good intentions. This is the same problem of mainline liberalism when they say that God knows the heart. Yeah, he does. And that's the problem. Paul tells us that even the best, most righteous, wonderful, well-intentioned actions that we could ever commit is like filthy, rotting, used up menstrual rags when compared to the holiness of God. Sin has tainted everything we do, even the good stuff. So here, Cranium offers up a failed internal critique because he brings in concepts that are not only foreign to biblical Christianity, but positively antithetical to it. So his internal critique fails. For me, the answer to this is tightly wound up in the concept of justice and bringing absolute balance to a system, with a perfect being balancing love and justice through mercy. But instead of giving the full dissertation on that, I would instead like to kind of take a brief look at this from a more psychological perspective. Without Jesus' sacrifice, how many people would actually accept God's love? Jesus' sacrifice is a means through which people must recognize their own failings and imperfection. Without seeing someone else, a human at that, suffer and pay the price for justice being fulfilled, how many people would actually accept this free gift from God? God allowing himself to pay the price is a divine act of reconciliation. This shows love is the ultimate act of a free will that denies oneself for others. God could force us to do whatever he wants, but the very nature of love requires it to be a choice. God could have made us robots, but he made us beings of free will. Without the sacrifice of Jesus, we miss out on love. An all-powerful being chose a course of action that allowed us for the experience and existence of love. So the question is, why couldn't God just forgive people? 
Why does there have to be sacrifice? Why, why does human sacrifice have to take place? Why did Jesus need to die in order for us to be forgiven? Couldn't God just forgive us? I mean, all right, he, he, he's the God of the universe. All powerful, unlimited resources. Snap his fingers, done. Well, he doesn't have fingers, but you get the point. Why couldn't he just forgive? Forgiveness is not that simple. Oftentimes we tend to think it is because the slights against us that we forgive aren't that big of a deal. But the thing is, all forgiveness has a cost. Right? A wrong has been done. Something has been violated. Trust has been broken. Money's been stolen. Property's been broken. Something has happened that has damaged something that now needs to be mended. And that mending requires a cost. Right? When you forgive someone for their debt, for their damage, for their offense, the price is still being paid. The only difference is you are the one who is paying it. Years ago, I had um, some roommates, and uh, there were about three of us, I had three or four of us, and we had, we had a house, uh, but I had an opportunity to go live somewhere else rent-free, a uh, good opportunity for me in college, and so I went, I took it, and like a dummy, because I was young, I left things in my name. Well, fast forward about six months, and I'm getting calls, and I'm getting bills, and I'm getting the landlord saying, hey, I'm kicking these people out, they're not paying rent, but that, house is in my name. And so I, here I am where I have some friends, people I care about, I've known for years, who had now have me on the hook for around the tune of six grand. Well, okay, um, I, I had the money, so I you know, paid the rent, I paid the bills and everything, settled all that, but the fact is that, well, I'm out six grand and they owe me. Th those were their bills. Th th that was their debt. They owe me the money they promised to pay and they didn't pay it. After a while, I, 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 just, I just forgave it. I just said, you know what? Forget it. Just, I got it. But here's the thing. I'm still out six grand. I still had to pay that money. Right? I'm a 21-year-old college kid. Six grand, that's a lot of money for me. So the cost was still taken on by me. What if you have a friend who breaks something? Right? Well, one time, a friend of a friend comes over. Uh, they sit down in a chair, break the chair. They didn't apologize. They didn't offer to replace it. Right? They, they just sat down, were goofing off, and broke my chair. Now I'm out of chair. I have to replace a chair. Well, I forget. But I still have to replace the chair. The, the cost was still there. See, forgiveness has cost. Right? And so we have committed an offense against God. We have used his stuff, stolen him, whatever way you want to view that, we are indebted to God. And so he can't just snap his fingers and make it go away. There is a cost that must be borne in order for forgiveness to take place. God has to take that on himself, right? There's still the matter of this transgression that we've committed. So he can't just, you know, snap his fingers and it's all away. No, there, there's still the debt that has to be handled. And the thing is that God is just and fair. He's just and fair. So it would actually be unfair and unjust to let someone get away with habitually stealing, misusing, and breaking your stuff. Let's say, for instance, that um, you, you know, let's say you got more money than Bill Gates, but you've got a friend who's always coming over without asking, then and just invites himself over, makes use of your stuff, eats the food in your fridge, breaks your toys, borrows money from you and never pays it back, and on and on and on, repeatedly. At some point, it doesn't matter that you've got more money than Bill Gates. At some point, it's like, okay, you're abusing me. You are mistreating me. You're, you're using my stuff in, in, in my house taking me for granted and mistreating me. It's not, a, it's not an issue of the money. You could easily just pay them, you know, whatever, okay, they broke a chair, they broke a whatever, they threw their Nintendo controller through my flat screen, well, you know, I, whatever, I got more money than Bill Gates, I can pay for it. No, at, at some point, it's not about the money. It's about the mistreatment. And so it is with God. We live in his world, right? We breathe his air, we eat his food, we use his stuff, and we use that breath he gave us to curse him. We misuse the other people he's created, 
harm them, hurt them, mistreat them? Right? That we live a life that he gave us and we're abusing it? It's on loan from him, but we're misusing it. It's his property, not ours. And so over and over again, at some point, it doesn't matter that he's all-powerful, has all the resources, um, unlimited, that he could just, you know, make it go away. We're mistreating him. We're, we're like the friend who's eating all your food and breaking all your stuff and borrowing money without paying you back. It, it's not about the stuff. It's not about the food. It's not about the money. Right? And so it is with us and God. So in order for him to forgive, he pays the cost of what we have damaged. And because he is just and fair, he's not a pushover, and so the cost has to be paid. The problem is we can't pay it. The problem is that we cannot pay it. Now, the cost is obvious whenever we're talking about things like money or property damage, but whenever you start to get into the more abstract ideas like, um, you know, moral transgressions and sin, it may not be quite as obvious, but the idea is still there. So take that idea from the debt, from the money, from the damage, and how forgiveness has a cost. Now translate it over into the idea of sin and moral transgression. Essentially, by our sin, what we are doing is we are using, abusing, and breaking God's stuff. His creation, his house, his rules, we're abusing him. We're rebelling against him. We're saying, forget you. Thank you for your stuff. Go away. Right? If someone was treating you like that, it wouldn't matter how much money you had. They're in the wrong. They need to pay. And the Bible says that the payment due for our sin is death. Romans 6, the wages of sin is death. What you have earned is death. That, that's the payment. That, that's what needs to be given to make up for what you have done. Right? If you break my window, what you need to pay me to make up for that window is the money for the cost of the window. Now what we have stolen from God is life. It's his life. He created He created us. He gave us our life. He, 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 when he's word gave, it kind of makes it sound like, well, here, cheers, do whatever you want with it. Um, it it's his. It's on loan from him. It, we we kind of owe it to him, but we took it. So what we owe is life, life for life. So why does it have to be so bloody? I mean, well, why does Jesus have to go through getting beaten and put on a cross? Why, why in the Old Testament does it have to be like bulls and lambs and goats and stuff? Why, why, why the blood? Why the brutality? Why can't he just be like, boom, okay, done, paid? I think that one thing we get wrong is the nature of sin. We tend to misunderstand the seriousness of sin and what it is. So one of the things that we are shown through both the sacrificial system in the Old Testament and the sacrifice of Jesus in the New Testament is the seriousness of, <clears throat> excuse me, the seriousness of sin. See, a lot of times we don't take, we don't take sin seriously. We think, oh, what's the big deal? Okay, I made a mistake. But to God, who by the way is the one who defines right and wrong to God whenever he says, no, that's, that's a big deal. Imagine you're watching with a coworker, you know, you're at work, maybe, you know, some, you're one of the most places to have a lobby with a TV or well, whatever. You're with someone, you're watching the news, and it's the latest school shooting, and the person next to you goes, well, what's the big deal? It's just a few kids. You'd be appalled. How dare you say that? What do you mean just a few kids? This is horrible. It's horrific. It's tragic. Look at this. It's appalling. Likewise, whenever we say to God, well, what's the big deal? Just a little sin. Right? It's just a little lie. It's no big deal. Well, to God, it's just like you looking at your friend who said, what's the big deal? Just a few dead kids. Oh, what do you mean just a few dead kids? In the same way, when we say, what's the big deal with sin? No, no. Part of the reason why sacrifice is needed, why, why it's so bloody, is because the seriousness of sin. And it stands as a reminder. Look at what your sin cost. Look at how tragic your sin is. And it's an example of the seriousness of sin. And this last comment 
in this question about our motives. You know, as a Christian, like I said, I'm trying to answer these as if I'm addressing Christians. And, and, and as a Christian, um, the, the whole reason you came to Christ was because you're a sinner. Because you know you're a sinner and, and, and you need forgiveness. And you know the intentions of your mind and your heart. This, this, this is one of those things that, well, God, God knows my intentions. Yes. Yes, he does know your intentions. And that should not comfort you. That should terrify you. An example I often will give, and I got it from somewhere else, but it's useful. I'll, I'll, I'll often use it as an example in my congregation. I'll say, okay, well, let's imagine that we could put a microchip or something in your brain and record all of your thoughts, all of your private, innermost conversation that you're having with yourself for just one day. And then we're going to invite all of your friends and family, your mom, your grandma, right, your little kid sister, and we're just going to put it up on a screen and let them see your intentions and your thoughts and the internal conversation going on in your head. Do you want to be in that room? Most are absolutely going to say no. No, because we know. You know what's in your head. You know what's in your thoughts. Your intentions? Oh, God should forgive me because he knows my intentions. Yes, he knows your intentions. That should be an occasion for fear, not an occasion for comfort. Thank you.